Good afternoon, Bill. Good afternoon. Delighted to be talking to you here today. We're going to be discussing connector strategies for growing and powering ecosystems across geographies and sectors. We sound like a pair of structural that's, engineers, that's right? Mouthful. Effectively, it's technology and banking, how digital strategies can grow revenues. I know Standard Chartered has been doing some interesting things in this space on the retail side and the wholesale side. You want to tell us a little bit about what you've been up to? Sure. Yeah, I think we have, uh, we have lots going on. And uh, part of this comes from the, the fact that, that uh, Standard Chartered is spread across 65 or so mm -hmm. markets. Uh, for our wholesale business, the retail is, is a bit smaller, uh, but we most value our network, and we think our clients most value our network. And of course, the, the nature of a network is connecting people together, one way or the other. And at, at its core, uh, we're connecting buyers and sellers of products, movers of money, uh, managers of risk, etc. Uh, all of which have two sides to either to, to, to any transaction, and, and we're we're the ones in the middle. Uh, so, so realization number one was for us that the value of our network is is the value of, of standard charter certainly the, the wholesale part of our business yeah I think the second thing that that's clear is that uh, nobody's big enough to conquer this market all by themselves mm -hmm. uh, but some are still bigger than us so we're I, I'd say we're a mid-sized global bank and uh, for us to satisfy the needs of, of our clients and, and deliver this network to them uh, we have to and we will continue to have to uh, develop technologies and mechanisms in partnership mm -hmm. with other people uh, that can help us connect one to another. And whether that comes in the form of fintech partners mm -hmm. or, or comes in the form of, uh, of uh, clients with whom we work closely to deliver their products and services, uh, these are the keys for us. And, and whether it's in, in, in uh, cross-border payments or domestic payments for that matter, mm -hmm. uh, trade finance, uh, security services, uh, then obviously getting into to foreign exchange trading rates, etc. Uh, we're trying to do as much as we can off of, a, off of an open platform mm -hmm. that Standard Chartered is providing. Mm -hmm. So you're looking at partnerships, you're looking at investments. How much is all this costing? What's your technology budget? Uh, we've stepped up our investment dramatically. So uh, I've been at Standard Chartered about four years now. Mm -hmm. And uh, at, at that time, we were spending about $650 million in, in sort of new investments, mm -hmm. uh, of which 90% uh, you know, plus was what I would call defensive things. So, so catching up. Uh, in terms of compliance or, or dealing with, with the acute obsolescence. Okay. Uh, last year we spent 1.6 billion, this year we'll spend 1.7 billion, something like that. Okay. Uh, with the, uh, the, the in, in entire increase and, and then some of the base uh, going to strategic things uh, okay. that we think are uh, either fundamentally improving the, the quality of the service that we're providing in, in, a, in a differentiated way uh, or, uh, or brand new markets or, or brand new segments. So uh, it, it's more than a tripling of our okay. discretionary investment spend. Yeah, $1.7 billion uh, for a bank whose aggregate expenses are $10 billion, mm -hmm. it's material. Uh, the bulk of that is, is on technology and technology-related projects. Obviously, there's people behind all that technology. Uh, but this is a, uh, a trend that we see increasing for some time. We th think we'll, we'll have a higher and higher proportion of our, uh, of our annual spend on technology. Okay. So of that, say, $1.6 billion, what percentage would be on innovation as opposed to just maintaining legacy systems? Uh, we, we break that out in our, in our public disclosures, and, and a little bit over a third is what we would call new innovation. Okay. Uh, another third is, uh, is uh, I would say, innovation or finding ways to do things more innovatively, mm -hmm. uh, but really it's taking what we have today and making it better. Mm -hmm. And then the third third is, is still defense. So we're, we're still, uh, we, I think like any bank, we have a technology deficit, which we're continuing to close. Mm -hmm. Uh, our our uh, investment spend on, on risk and compliance has reduced uh, on the back of many years of, of sort of above trend growth, uh, but it's been offset at least in part by increases in, in investment in cybersecurity, for example, just, right. just to pick an obvious one. Yeah. So you, you mentioned it's material, right? It's about 10% of your overall spend. But if we look at, say, the U.S. banks, um, I think globally this year, the U.S. banks are going to spend about $115 billion on technology. JP Morgan, your old shop, has a technology budget of over 11 billion. Yep. European banks, by comparison, I think, are projected to be spending 77 billion. Right. Have the US banks kind of won the, won the tech arms race? It's a really interesting one. Uh, yeah, I, I think if, if the only thing that mattered was what you spend yourself on your proprietary systems, uh, the US banks, maybe seconded by the Chinese, would already have won. But of course, that's not the story. Uh, you know, for every dollar that we spend, uh, we've probably got another two dollars that, that our partners are spending. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we're effectively renting rather than buying, if you could look at it that way. So it, it, it does lead to an, an increase in expenses right. over time. Uh, but we feel that we have access to the best technology in the market. Uh, sometimes we develop it ourselves. Sometimes we get it through, uh, through outsourced solutions from, from somebody else. Sometimes we get it through partnerships. So, 
Uh, for example, we're, we're, we're building a, a de novo virtual bank in Hong Kong, mm -hmm. uh, which is one of the, the licenses. We were in the first batch to receive a, a virtual bank license in, in Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. And uh, while we're building that, that bank ourselves, we have 35% uh, ownership of that venture through two partners, Hong Kong Telecom, you know, the incumbent mobile and fixed line provider in Hong Kong, and Ctrip, largest travel agent in the world. Yeah. Uh, obviously, they're bringing their, their clients. So they'll be helping us with, uh, with the, uh, the, not just the expense, but also the technology. And then each of the components that we're putting into that bank, which is it's, it's from, the, from the core banking system on up, right. it's, it's new, uh, will either come from Standard Chartered in a, in a drag and drop, that's the minority, uh, or will be coming from partners uh, right. who either have a product that they've already developed that we're plugging in, or that they're developing along with us. Now, what's our technology spend on that? Yeah. Is, is, is it the, the sum of what all of our partners have spent or just what we have? So, uh, so do I think we can go head to head with JP Morgan uh, or uh, Bank of China in the things that we're doing? Absolutely no question about it. In the areas that you're focusing on? In the areas that we focus on. Okay. You mentioned that kind of de novo online bank, very interesting. Uh, you have something similar already, am I right, in the Ivory Coast? That's is right. that right? How does that work, having an online presence versus your physical location, right? Yeah. How, how does that, I want to make sure you're not cannibalizing your existing proposition, right? Well, you know, we, we may cannibalize part of our existing proposition, okay. and, and that's okay, because obviously, the, as the saying goes, if we don't cannibalize it, somebody else will. Uh, Africa was different. Uh, Africa, we, uh, we sat down with our African team. In fact, our African team sat down with themselves, and we're, okay. we're present in 17 countries in Africa, uh, 10 of which we have retail. And the African team said, look, the, 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 the guys are building this fantastic new virtual bank in Hong Kong. But realistically, by the time they build it in Hong Kong, deliver it, and then maybe they're going to do Singapore or China or Taiwan, uh, Africa is going to be in 2022 or 2023 sometime. We need something today. We need something that differentiates us today. So we're going to take the existing standard charter technology, which is somewhere between pretty good and very good, so kind of award-winning mobile banking apps for, for most of the past uh, decade, including last year. Uh, so there's some good things to work off of. They said, we'll build this ourselves, but using existing standard charter technology. So it won't be the latest cutting edge mobile banking and, and payments technology, but it'll be very good. Uh, and we'll start, in, in our case, we started in Cote d'Ivoire. Why Cote d'Ivoire? Well, because we don't have a retail banking business right. in Cote d'Ivoire. So we, we, we started there and said, if we can make it relevant in, in the Ivory Coast, then, uh, then it, surely it can be relevant in other markets. The next eight markets that we've launched in uh, have been markets where we do have okay. a retail presence. And uh, the, the sort of the worst case that we see is that our clients see that they have an alternative channel. They used to be able to deal with us uh, in a branch or maybe on, on a mobile banking app mm -hmm. with limited functionality. Right. Now they can deal with us on a mobile banking app with a lot of functionality. Right. Uh, pretty much all the functionality they can get in the bank, uh, in the branch. So th this is, uh, it that doesn't feel particularly threatening. Uh, the game in Africa is to vastly expand the market. Right. Hong Kong is different. Hong Kong is saturated in terms of, of uh, banking markets. So, uh, there are virtually no people in Hong Kong that, that don't have a bank account. Um, and we know that, that, uh, that the leading player in that market has a market share to, together with, with affiliates of close to 40%. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and with, a, with a, obviously a heavy emphasis on the mass market, because you yeah. can only get to 40% if you cover the mass market, we have a small market share in the mass market. We have a big market share in the affluent population. So we, we will target this virtual bank at the client segment that, where we're least penetrated. Of course, there will be some cannibalization, and that's fine, okay. uh, because we'll be giving our customers what they want. So in those markets in Africa where you've got the online presence and the physical presence, what has been the upshot? Have you seen customers leave one and move to the other? In, in Africa? Yeah. So in Africa, we've, we've given the mobile banking application to Both. our existing customers, right. so they don't have to do anything. It's just okay. there, and, and added a bit of functionality. They have to download the app, uh, which they're doing in size. Uh, of course, the, the objective for us is to significantly increase the number of clients we have. And that's been happening. Our, our pace of client acquisition is between 30% and 300% higher okay. uh, since we launched this mobile banking platform. Okay. Now, in, in Hong Kong, the, the launch of the online bank hasn't happened yet. And it, am I right in thinking it's being delayed? The, the protests have, have slowed things down? Is that no, no, no. I mean, the protests have had, have had no effect. The, uh, the licenses were given out earlier this year. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they came in two batches. We were in the first batch. There was another group in the second batch. No one has launched yet. Uh, you know, there's, a, as you would expect, quite a rigorous uh, quality control process that the regulator will go through. Uh, but I would hope that we would launch ours in the early part of next year, and I would hope that we would be uh, one of the earlier ones to launch, but you know, we'll see where other people are. Uh, the protests are, of course, concerning for all sorts of reasons, but uh, we've got a, a dedicated team that's, that's focusing on this and a dedicated site, and nobody's had any trouble getting to work in the morning. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, nobody's working any less hard than they, than they did before, so, mm -hmm. so we're, we're on track. 
I mean, with those protests, the sort of people that are protesting, you're talking young people, millennials, the, the sort of mar market I would imagine you're targeting for your online bank. Is that going to be tricky to navigate? You know, will these people potentially be looking for their, their payments provider, their online bank to you know, stand up and be counted, as it were? Is, is that something that you're anticipating as, as something you're going to have to navigate? I, th I, I think that could be a helpful thing for us. I, I don't know. But uh, yeah, yes, we are targeting the, the millennial population mm -hmm. and the, uh, who obviously are, are young by definition, but also you know, people who aspire to affluence. Right. And, uh, yeah, the, the, the objective with our, uh, with our virtual bank is to, is to offer a package, including the, the brand that comes with it. It'll be separately branded, but you know, sort of a powered by a standard chartered thing. Uh, to, to, to bring in the, the strength of the standard charter brand, it's helpful that our name is on the bank notes. We're seen as a, as a very stable player and a very committed player in the Hong Kong market. Also a meaningful business in, in China, uh, which, is, which is also helpful. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, you know, four of the other virtual banks that receive licenses have sort of uh, mainland Chinese anchors. They'll have a difficult job navigating that right. the sentiment right now okay. uh, with that population. Um, so that might be even a competitive advantage for you because you're not seen to be part of Chinese mainland. Know, Is that sort of what you mean? You're not, you're you know, no, I just think I think each each of us will have our, our own challenges. I think mm -hmm. the, the challenge. Uh, we have is, is uh, the, the, the millennials will look at us and say, oh yeah, that's my father's bank, right. or my mother's okay. bank, right? Okay. That's, you know, that's not how we want to position this. And obviously, another uh, prospective client would say, oh yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a bank from the mainland. Right. Uh, they haven't been here for a long time. Mm -hmm. And another will say, oh yeah, that's a, that's a, you know, a Tencent or, or Ali, and, and I, uh, I see their QR code readers everywhere, mm -hmm. and that looks quite convenient. Uh, but is it a bank? And, right. and w w what, 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 what do I lose by not dealing with them? So I think there will be questions for all of us. And that's part of why the, uh, the, the Monetary Authority in Hong Kong is, is, is being quite cautious about mm -hmm. how they roll this out to make sure that it lands relatively well. Mm -hmm. In that market, when, when you guys all start actually operating, you're going to be going to head to head with Ant Financial, which is funny, you know, having worked in New York, you know, there's been a lot of talk about the threat from Silicon Valley. Um, is Ant Financial kind of overlooked? Are they the kind of competitor that everyone should be looking over their shoulder at? I think everybody that's participating in this little venture is mm -hmm. somebody to be taken seriously. Right. Ant and Tencent uh, both have ubiquitous payment apps in China. Uh, and they're much less relevant, but still relevant, in the rest of Asia. Uh, so they, and, and they have outstanding technology. Right? Mm -hmm. there's, there's just no question. And they have access to, to excellent technical resources mm -hmm. uh, in the mainland, but obviously they can, they can build that uh, outside as well. So, uh, so I think they've got all sorts of advantages. Yeah. Uh, but they don't have the depth of, uh, of experience and, uh, and, and understanding of Hong Kong. Keep in mind, Hong Kong is a city of uh, a semi-autonomous region of 8 million people. Right. Right? It's, it's a small Chinese city. Mm -hmm. right? it's, it probably isn't at the very top of the, uh, of the mainland Chinese pecking order for things to, to nail. Uh, getting the next 8 million people that flow into Chongqing over the next 10 years is, yep. is, is probably a little bit easier. So uh, I think from, uh, from that perspective, there's plenty of competition, mm -hmm. but, but we're perfectly comfortable that we, have, uh, that we can develop a differentiated proposition that, that our customers will want. I've seen some estimates that there's going to be 30% of the market, maybe $15 billion in revenue up for grabs in the Hong Kong market with this new online strategy. Do you, those figures make sense to you? Do you think it's, the competition is going to be that fierce? I, well, it, it'll get there if the, if the proposition is really differentiated. Uh, at the outset, if you just look at the capital that is, you know, it's, it's all public, the, the capital that has been committed as part of the license applications that the eight recipients have made, it translates through to about a 2% deposit market share. Okay. Right. So, uh, and it'll take a while for each of us to ramp up to the point where we use all the capital that we've, that we've raised at the outset. Now, obviously, the successful ones will keep on growing, and they'll, they'll grow their assets, and they'll grow their liabilities. And, uh, and that will, uh, if they're successful, will obviously come from someplace else because the banking market is pretty saturated today. Right. Uh, like our, our objective is, is pure and simple. We expect to have a, a bigger market share at the end of this rather than a smaller, and we expect to be making more money rather than less. Why else would we do it? Yeah. Uh, uh, but, uh, but most importantly, we think that this is what our clients want, and we want to make sure that we're at the, at the, the edge of, of our, what our clients are demanding rather than somehow responding to that. So what sort of targets do you, do you, do you have targets that you can share with us for, the, for that venture? I mean, what sort of percentage of the market share are you aiming for? You no, know, we, we're not, we're not uh, being public about specific targets. Uh, we intend to significantly increase our market share in the mass market and, and amongst millennials. Okay. I just mentioned Silicon Valley briefly before. Um, just coming back to that, what's your view? Is, is Silicon Valley a huge threat to the traditional banking industry? I mean, 
Amazon, Google, Apple, they all offer financial services, but none of them seem to have an appetite for becoming a full service bank with all the hassle and regulatory headaches that that brings. Yeah, and I, and I don't blame them for not wanting to be full service banks. I think most of us who are bankers in the room would agree that, that with that comes a big burden right. and, uh, and plenty of challenges. So uh, to the extent that, that uh, whether Silicon Valley or, or, or Shenzhen or Silicon Roundabout can skim cream off the banking market uh, without having the burden of being a bank, that's great. Uh, and I think in the, in the early rollout of, of fintech and big tech in China, there was some opportunity to skim cream. And I think now that you know, the Chinese regulatory environment is, is flattening out. Yeah. Uh, Hong Kong has been quite keen as they roll out virtual banks to make sure that it's a level playing field. And it's a genuinely level playing field. The virtual banks, if anything, have a small disadvantage because we cannot have a physical presence. Right. Right? So the uh, uh, Silicon Valley has, uh, clearly has tremendous things to add uh, to the extent that you can package financial services in with, uh, with other consumer or corporate offerings. It's a tremendous advantage, and we've seen that uh, over and over with, uh, with each of the business models that you described. So there's, there's everything to play for. The key for the banks is to, is to understand the banking needs of our customers and, and create our own ecosystems uh, that are compelling. Uh, and to play off of that one thing that uh, I think banking will retain for some time uh, after everything mm -hmm. else has changed, which is an element of trust. Mm -hmm. uh, is, I mean, you, you wouldn't guess it reading, uh, maybe Reuters, you wouldn't see this, but you know, reading the Financial Times, you wouldn't guess it that banks are trusted. But, uh, but the fact is, people do trust banks. Mm -hmm. to, they trust them with their data, they mm -hmm. trust them with their money, uh, and they, they trust them to basically give good advice, which is why I think people get so upset when it turns out that right. in some cases banks didn't give good mm -hmm. advice. Uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's deeply upsetting. Uh, but the banking industry has, uh, has taken uh, great, great, uh, gone to great lengths to, uh, to rebuild the, right. some of the trust that was damaged. And I think it's still a big competitive advantage of ours. Mm -hmm. We must be sure that that translates through to data. Mm -hmm. You're right. I mean, the banks have certainly been run through the, the mill for lots of past sins. We've also seen the technology companies of late get into trouble for playing fast and loose with their customers' data. How do you make sure that you and, and other bankers don't end up you know, on Capitol Hill or in, in front of the European Commission apologizing for what you did to customer data? In other words, what sort of protections do you wrap around yeah. your offering? Well, there's, there's the intentional misuse of customer data right. and there's the unintentional. Yeah. The unintentional You've is... You've got to be careful about your partners as well, right? Your well, joint venture I mean, partners. Massive focus on cybersecurity. And, and I think we, we all recognize that one of the, the, the greatest vulnerabilities on the, on the cybersecurity front is our third-party service providers, right. mm -hmm. uh, which in some cases for some banks will be thousands of uh, people, each and every one of which needs to be vetted mm -hmm. uh, given that they have access to either the bank's data or, or worse, the bank's systems. But th that's the, the unintentional sharing. In terms of, of intentional sharing, uh, I think we, I, I know that Standard Chartered, and I imagine it's the case with every bank, mm -hmm. is very, very careful about the way that we use customer data. Mm -hmm. Now, in Europe, with GDPR, uh, there, there's quite stringent rules, uh, which any of us can quibble over the, the, some of the specifics, but, but directionally, this is a very good thing, and mm -hmm. have to think that the rest of the world will be following right. the, the European lead on, on data protection. Uh, but that doesn't, that's not enough. That's, that's, that's a necessary condition to operate. Uh, I think the key for a bank is, is not just to, uh, to, to protect data per the law, but to protect data per the customer's expectations, including the things that the customer doesn't know that she or he should be concerned about right. uh, until, until well after the fact. Something that, that obviously the, uh, I, I think the social media companies have allowed or been forced by either uh, public policymakers or by their customers to roll stuff back. Uh, I think it's critical for the banking industry to be in front of the client expectations rather than behind them. So would it be an idea then to take the European standard as it's, as you think it's the direction everyone's going to go and take that and apply it to your offerings in other regions and other countries? Is that what you're doing? Well, that's as a starting point. I mean, right. I, 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 there'd be no, no explanation for having less stringent data mm -hmm. rules. You may, de you may deploy them differently, but probably to make them better rather than to, 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 to water them down. Uh, but that's, but that's, that's not sufficient in some cases. I think we'll, we'll uh, when, we, when customers are sharing uh, some of their insights about their the retirement planning, mm -hmm. uh, or some of the, the, the details that they might share about their health in the right. context of, of buying uh, health insurance or life insurance. Uh, they may not, there may not be legislation in Thailand that protects that data, but there certainly would be in a bank like ours. Right. We, we've talked about partnerships, joint ventures. Um, Goldman obviously has a joint venture with Apple. Are there any of the tech companies that you would be, you know, what would be your dream partner? Do you, do you have one? Is there any particular tech company that you think would be a good fit for Standard well, we Chartered? Have, we, you know, we have lots of dream partners and, and we deal with lots of them. I think we probably have you know, a couple of hundred partnerships mm -hmm. with fintechs one way or another. Yeah, we've done a, a series of, uh, we have a series of partnerships with Ant Financial right. uh, on cross-border remittances. Mm -hmm. So really leveraging their 
you know, deep penetration of, uh, of customers with their wallets. And we started with Hong Kong and the Philippines, mm -hmm. uh, helping uh, expatriate workers in the Philippines get their money back home. Mm -hmm. uh, the second uh, bilateral partnership that we, or the, the, the second uh, payment corridor that we opened up was Pakistan, Malaysia. Okay. And we hope to have many more of those. Uh, on, the, on the corporate side, we've we partnered with, uh, with Link Lodges to, to develop a, a much deeper supply chain okay. uh, solution for customers. In some cases, we're, we're, we're building and rolling out the platforms ourselves. So uh, we've got a, an SME-based open platform that we're launching in India uh, that will help SMEs connect to each other, uh, but also help them connect to financial services providers, uh, to their suppliers, uh, to the people to whom they're selling. Uh, and, and that will, will have an embedded series of partnerships with technology companies and, and, and others. So I mean, partnerships are, uh, you know, I mentioned the, the, the virtual bank in Hong Kong, mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and, but, but hanging off that virtual bank will be dozens of, of APIs that will right. allow other partners to, to plug in as we are able to, to identify a customer need, but also right. bring in the right partners with, with the proper vetting, et cetera. Uh, I, I, this is, I think this is the way of the future for everybody. It's particularly critical for us because we're not going to outspend right. JP Morgan right. or HSBC. Yeah. Uh, you know, you, you, one of the nice things about Standard Charter Bank is that kind of you're emerging market bank, so you have great insights into what's going on in countries in Asia, Africa. From a fintech perspective, um, are there any companies or products that you name check, th things that we should be keeping an eye out for, you know, innovative things that are happening there that we haven't got here in Europe or in, or in the States? I think Asia has been a real uh, hotbed of innovation, and obviously a lot of it initially started in China. The right. Revolution of the in, in the uh, small val small value payment systems, um, but also peer to peer lending, and you know yeah. some of these things have gotten a bad name. But but when you look at, at the yeah. the heart of, of Chinese finance, it's, it's been quite spectacular. Um, but you get companies like uh, you know, like Grab out of Singapore uh, that you know, started with with uh, ride sharing, but have moved well beyond that in terms of e commerce platforms. Mm -hmm. Uh, providing a, uh, a real insight in many different markets to uh, how, the, uh, how the customs and, and, the, and the customer demand preferences mm -hmm. are different even in countries mm -hmm. that, are, that are physically quite proximate. Uh, and this creates many opportunities for a bank, both to do our own thing, uh, so leveraging the existing customer platforms that we have, or to partner with some right. of them, uh, or to partner with other people that really wish they were them in the first place. Right. So, I mean, there's a lot of wannabe grabs and a lot of, yes. of wannabe DDs and a lot of wannabe JDs and uh, and a lot of wannabe Alibabas, um, and you know, every one of the, the wannabes has an opportunity to leapfrog in this environment because we're still at a very early stage. Yeah. Uh, and in some cases, we may be the one that helps them leapfrog, or maybe they put it the other way around. Maybe right. they're the ones that help us leapfrog. Right. So you're talking about investments. Um, Standard Chart, if I'm right in thinking, is going to invest in the second vision fund. Is, is that right? I mean, that's obviously one way of getting access to or an, you know, a return on some of the technologies that are out there. What sort of funds are you going to be putting in? Do you, have a, do you have a figure yet for how much you plan to invest? No, I, I think uh, the Vision Fund came out with, with some sort of a statement around memoranda of understanding. And look, we, we, we believe in what they're doing. Mm -hmm. uh, they've obviously you know, got some challenges right now with WeWork that's in the news every day, but, but many of their other investments have, have, been, have been quite compelling. Um, and uh, and it, is, it is visionary. Uh, we lend money. That's, our, I mean, that's the nature of our investments. So that would be what we would be doing in, in the Vision Fund as well. Uh, but uh, leverage is an important part of the Vision Fund model, and we hope to play a central role in, uh, in helping them realize the full potential of, of the, the underlying equity right. that they're putting into the fund. Would you have particular oversight over any of the investments that, that you know you would be investing in? I, we would have, I mean, all details to be agreed, but we'd have the oversight that would be consistent with being a lender to a fund. Okay. No smoking pot in the company plane. I, I, well, no, no company plane. How can, you, <laughs> okay. how can you smoke pot if you're not on the G6 in the first place? We're coming close to the end. Is there anything, any particular product, strategy, um, company that really excites you kind of globally as you look at the, the, the fintech payments technology space? I, 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 I watched with, uh, with great interest to see our, you know, our friends and client Stripe achieve a, a, mm -hmm. a, a, a post new money valuation of $35 billion, uh, which is really a striking figure mm -hmm. when you think that this is a, a company that didn't exist 12 years ago that uh, is, is carving out that much value, and you know, some will quibble over whether that's the real value. I mean, smart people have paid that mm -hmm. money uh, to invest in that company. Uh, to, uh, and, and that company is, is simply dealing with some of the inefficiencies of the existing right. payment systems yep. uh, in, in the market. So you know, when, when, we, when we talk to our, our, our good friends at Swift, uh, we say, look, this is, this is value that, 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 of course, it's great if somebody else can, can bring new innovation. Let's make sure that we're doing the same thing. 
And I'm really happy to say that, that in our discussions with SWIFT, and I think all the discussions around Cybos, this is the area where we're, uh, I won't say fighting back, because there's room for all of us yeah. in this market. Uh, but there's, you know, there's some great innovation where people are identifying unmet customer needs. Uh, even today, despite the fierce competition between yeah. banks and outstanding institutions like SWIFT, there's money being left on the table that other people who are a little bit nimbler than we are, yeah. or a little bit more innovative, are finding ways to attract. And that, that must be our mission. Bill, thank you very much. Thank you.